In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear saints, when you read or hear the Scriptures, you know that it is God Himself who speaks therein. You know that it is God's own Word, speaking to you, even warning you when necessary, warning you of what indeed He has commanded, teaching you how you are to live according to His will, and yet also it is His Word giving you great and sweet and blessed promises. Promises of life, salvation, even eternal life. But it's not enough to know that God is speaking these things in His Word. What you need to know is, are these promises for you? What is spoken in the Scriptures is not always spoken to you. Sometimes the Lord is speaking to particular people, particular times and places. Every word that he speaks to ancient Israel is not a word to you individually. So you must ask, who then are these promises for? Are they for me? If not, well then what a disaster we find ourselves in. If forgiveness and life and salvation are not promised to you in these words, well then what hope do we have? But Jesus went out from the area he was serving and ministering in, in Galilee and even the regions around Jerusalem, perhaps. He goes out from those places and he finds himself in the territory of the Canaanites. And there he meets this Canaanite woman. And you have to understand, in that time and in that place and in those days, to the people of Israel, the Canaanites were the ancient enemy. They were unbelievers. They were pagans. They were not worshipers of the true God. They were outside the covenant, practicers of idolatry. They were practicers of a demonic religion in the midst of a demonic culture. They needed deliverance. This woman needed deliverance, deliverance for her daughter. She needed salvation from all the works of Satan. And so she hears that Jesus is coming by. What are the odds that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, and all that she's heard about him, what are the odds he would come to her near Tyre and Sidon? Are the promises for her? Does she have any hope in Christ? Dear saints, are God's promises for you? When you hear them spoken, when you hear them proclaimed? If not, you find yourself always doubting, never knowing, Never knowing what the outcome will be. Never knowing if God is really for you or not. Never knowing if He really aims to help you or not. Never knowing if He really intends to give you eternal life or not. How can you ever know if your sins are forgiven unless these promises are for you? And so this poor Canaanite woman must be left wondering, are these promises for me. After all, this God of Israel spoke to his people Israel of old, and she thinks to herself, I'm not Israel. This woman is not part of Israel. Or is she? Who is Israel anyway? What does it mean to be a member of the covenant, a part of God's people? If you ask the Pharisees, and they often told Jesus this very thing, to be Israel was to be a child of Abraham to be a son of Abraham. And yet we know from the New Testament that to be a son of Abraham means a lot more than just his blood. Abraham, after all, was called out from a pagan nation, called out from an idolatrous people. Abraham had faith in the promises that God spoke to him, even when they seemed totally impossible. That beyond hope, he hoped in the promise God spoke to him of a son of an heir, even of a land. And Abraham even trusted in God's own word and in his own promises when God seemed with every word to be saying no. Yes, the Lord promised to Abraham a son, a promised son who would be his heir. And then once born, he told him, go up to the mountain and slaughter him. 
Everything about it seemed to be a big, fat no. The promises must be at an end. This God must have been leading me on the whole time. Abraham thinks nothing of the sort. He hopes in God beyond hope. He trusts his every word and trusts even that God is able and willing to bring back his son to him even from the dead. That somehow, some way, God will fulfill his promises for me, Abraham says. Or maybe to be Israel means that you're descended from Jacob. After all, it was he who was named Israel by God, as we heard in our Old Testament. But to be Israel is always about more than being just a son of Jacob. After all, even Jacob wasn't Israel at first. And so you heard in the account, Jacob, off on his own, off wandering, away from his family, away from the land, meets God one night as God comes and wrestles with him. And he wrestles with God until daybreak. And as far as Jacob can tell, it seems like this God that has appeared to him is just trying to kill him. But he clings to him all the more. He pins him down. He holds fast to this God that is trying to kill him. And he will not let him go until he blesses him. And in this way, he becomes Israel, the one who fights with God and prevails. Being Israel is about more than just who you're related to. It's about this struggling with God and prevailing upon Him. Dear saints, you may often find yourselves wrestling with your God. God, you're supposed to take care of me. You promised to protect me and to uphold me, to always be with me. Why am I still sick? Why have I lost my job? Why am I still alone? Do you not care? Why have you let my child suffer? Why have you let my child Fall away from the faith. Why, O oh Lord, are your promises really at an end? Now we know how it went with Jacob. How in the end God did bless him, but the whole time the struggle was going on, he didn't know that that's what would happen. He had no certainty of the outcome. It just looked like God wanted it to kill him. And so it is, dear saints, when you're in the midst of your struggle with God himself, you don't know the outcome. You cannot see how the thing ends. And you can't see what God's doing or why on earth he's doing it to you. All you can do is keep on struggling and keep on clinging to the very God with whom you are wrestling. And that's what Jacob did, after all. He kept on clinging, wrestling with God until he won. Now, God plays a little trick. He cheats, honestly. He strikes his hip, throws it out of joint, of course, God could have done much worse if he wanted to. He could have thrown him down from the beginning, could have set all his joints out of joint. He could have pinned him down all the way from the beginning. This was never meant to be a fair fight. But Jacob clings all the same. God was letting him cling to him, letting him win even. So tell me this, dear saints. What kind of fighter enters the ring intending to let the other guy win? Apparently, your God does. If your God wanted to crush you, he could. He wouldn't bother wrestling with you. If you're still struggling with him, it's because he wants you to pin him down. It's because he wants to be be beaten. He wants to be prevailed against. He wouldn't bother struggling with you if he was just going to crush you or abandon you. And even once Jacob starts to suspect who this is that he's wrestling with, he holds on. Let me go, God says. Let me go. But Jacob pins him down. Lord, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so God blesses him and names him Israel, the one who strives with God and prevails. This is how it always is with our God. He's always giving himself to his people so that they can wrestle with him, so that they can prevail upon him with faith. It was by faith that Jacob clung to God and pinned him down on his promises, that he would be his God and the God of his fathers, that he would give to him all the promises he gave to his father Isaac and his father Abraham. And Abraham, by faith, Abraham trusted God even when he seemed to be taking away all that he had promised. And Abraham, by that faith, was counted righteous. He received the blessing not just for himself, but as it says, all the nations of the world will be blessed 
through this child of promise. And so it was by great faith that this Canaanite woman followed after Jesus, cried out to him, wouldn't leave him alone. First he ignores her, but she keeps crying. She keeps following him. And then she says, no, it's not for you. It's for the children of Israel. It's not for you. But she keeps pleading, keeps imploring until finally he calls her a dog, tells her in no uncertain terms, this is not for you. But here our Lord is just at the old game once again, giving himself to her in the most strange, mysterious, contradictory way of all, giving himself to her to fight against, to wrestle with him, so that he can be beaten and pinned down by her faith. She clings to him all the more. She prevails upon him. She persists. She won't let him go until she gets even that scrap from her master's table. And with an unshakable faith, she wins from him the blessing. A Gentile she may have been, true by all accounts, outside the covenant, cut off from the true God and his promises. But as St. Paul teaches us, No one is a Jew or an Israelite who is merely one outwardly. It was never about the flesh. It was never about who your grandparents were. It was about faith. By this faith, the Canaanite woman proved herself that day a true child of Abraham, more so than any of those Pharisees who would have excluded her. For Scripture says it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. For it was by faith that she, like Abraham, came out from an idolatrous people and nation to pursue the true God when the chance struck her, to seek his blessing. And it was by faith that, like Abraham, she trusted in our Lord's goodness to receive a blessing that she in no way had deserved. And like Abraham, she persisted in faith and trust, even when our Lord seemed to be snatching away the promise away from her. Gentile she may have been, but by faith she enrolls her name among the long list of Gentiles. Rahab the Canaanite, Ruth the Moabite, even the very ancestors of our Lord, all who came to share in the blessings of Israel, who received their own crumbs of the grace, falling down from the table God prepared for his children. These Gentiles, grafted in, as Paul says, as new branches upon the vine of Jacob. By faith, this Canaanite woman proves herself to truly be Israel, the one who struggles with God and prevails. This is part of who God is. He gives himself to be wrestled with. He lets his people pin him down so that they can prevail even against God himself. So do not fear, dear saints. Do not fear when you find yourself wrestling with God. It's one thing when you find yourself wrestling with the world, wrestling against the devil, perhaps. But when God himself becomes your enemy, it's him giving himself to you, desiring you to pin him down for your own good, to receive the blessing. When our Lord went out to Tyre and Sidon that day, he knew what he was doing. He went exactly in order to give himself to this Canaanite woman that she might pin him down by faith. He's exactly the kind of wrestler who enters the ring in order to lose. After all, this is the same Son of God who came down from his throne, who came down into the world for one reason, to be pinned down, to be nailed to the cross, to let himself be pinned down by your sin and to suffer to give himself over to you, to be beaten, to be mocked and bruised and crushed and pierced even. He struggled with death and entered that great and mighty contest specifically in order to lose, to let death prevail over him so that letting death prevail, he might triumph for you. God, who has ultimate power of life and death, took on himself human flesh specifically in order to let death take hold of him. And yet, At the same time, this God upon the cross is not just the God who gives himself to you to be wrestled with. He is also the true Israel, the one who wrestles with God. Upon the cross, he became the enemy not only of death and hell and the devil, but he even cries out, My God, why have you forsaken me? Our Lord knows what it means to wrestle with God, to feel the abandonment, And even while he is being the God who gives himself up for you, he lets himself be conquered. And he is at the same time God who wrestles with God as his enemy. This was no play fight. It was not just a game. It was not just there for show. 
The Lord did not cry out these words just to prove a point. God poured out upon His Son the full wrath against sin and evil. And there upon the cross, God even let His Son die. And yet even in that suffering, even in that moment of abandonment, Jesus, the true Israel, persists. He trusts in God. He fulfills His Father's will. He has perfect faith even to the end that God will, in fact, fulfill all of His promises through this very suffering. This Israel... This man who is God suffers to be pinned down and beaten, and yet he prevails. By his faith and his obedience, he wins God's blessing, not for himself, but for you, dear saints, for all mankind, forgiveness and righteousness and life for all who suffer and wrestle and struggle with God. So, dear saints, I tell you again, when you look at the cross, when you see all of the promises of God fulfilled, it's not enough to know that it's God dying there, to see His promises being fulfilled. The question is, is it for you? Who is it for? For whom has He died? Who is this passion and death given for? If it's not for you, then what good is it? If it's not for you, what help is it to you in all of your sufferings and struggles? You would remain cut off outside the covenant without hope in God. And perhaps at times you even may find yourself thinking, It can't be for me, not after what I've done. Not for me, maybe it's for those who have their life put together. Not after all that I'm struggling with, all of this, it must be surely the sign that it's not for me. Not so, dear saints, not so. For the Lord came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The Lord gives himself exactly for those who do not have it all put together. The Lord gives himself exactly for those who have the greatest need of it. And if you ever doubt whether the promises in the scriptures of life and forgiveness and salvation, if you ever wonder whether that death and resurrection is for you, well then just remember what the Lord has already done for you and spoken to you. Remember indeed how he has called you by his gospel, enlightened you in holy baptism. Indeed, when he washed you and cleansed you in holy baptism, he said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Not someone else, not that guy over there, not the people in general. You, he says. He claims you as his own. He claims you and puts his name on you and he washed away your sin. And so also today when you heard the absolution, and indeed now as you prepare to receive the Lord's Holy Supper, he comes to you to put that very crucified and risen body and blood not on someone else's tongue, but to you. He pours eternal life into your own throat. The Lord speaks to you in the word and the sacraments. And that is how you know. That is how you find out at last who these promises are for. For he has spoken to you, dear saints. So because your Lord Jesus truly, truly has struggled with God for you, because he has striven with God and prevailed, now you too get to be truly Israel in him. For whoever has this suffering, wrestling, dying God as his God, whoever trusts in him has the promises of blessing and salvation from sin and death. And with this faith in the promise, you too now may go and wrestle with God, even the Lord himself. And whether God has struck your health or your family, permitted you to suffer without explanation, or maybe you yourself have sinned and made God your enemy, however it comes about that you are wrestling with God, you have a weapon against Him. It is faith. Faith which is born of God's own promises. Faith which looks to the faithfulness of Christ, who has wrestled once for all for you upon the cross, and indeed wrestled with death on your behalf and has prevailed. And by this faith, Jacob and Abraham, and the Canaanite woman, all of them, all the same, pinned God down on his own promises. So you too, dear saints, whenever you find God's goodness doesn't seem so nice, whenever you find the Lord seemingly trying to destroy you and kill you, whenever you find yourself struggling with God and he becomes your enemy, cling all the more to him. Do not let go. Pin him down by faith until he fulfills what he has promised for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.